representative of the Palestinian delegation to the United States, Ambassador Dr. Hussam Zalman. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Dear Jeremy Ben Ami, that was the voice of God just before I. <laughs> I mean. And the leadership and the members of J Street, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be with you at such an inspiring conference. To be among the thousands of brave women and men of all ages, and I see many, many young, young, I can see many young faces around. Every year to defend your values and principles, to give a voice for the mainstream American Jewish community. I was one of the first Palestinian officials to speak at J Street in its early stage of establishment. It feels like yesterday. Then I said that nothing, nothing is more missing than a motivated and principled organization that gives a voice and a call of action to the silent majority of the American Jewish community, to the many who believe in peace and who keep the hope for a better tomorrow. I am inspired to see your conference today, to follow the evolution of your organization, becoming the mainstream American Jewish organization defending peace, to witness your growth, your growth both in numbers and impact. Your voice has become loud and clear, and your contribution to the U.S. political landscape is widely recognized. My friends, you were never outnumbered, and that's why I said what I said this. You were never outnumbered. All those who believe in a different tomorrow, all those who carry hope, all those who believe in the goodness of the humankind are always never outnumbered, but you were out-organized. And today, and today, as I said then many years ago, you give us hope and confidence about the future. Because the future is not shaped by those who merely witness it. The future is shaped by those who author it. And I, I see many of you here who have taken a decision not to only witness the future, but to author the future for all of us. Thank you very much. And it is an opportunity to commend you, to commend J Street, to commend the relentless work, your dedication, your investment, your putting up with all that came your way. It is an occasion to commend you, and I repeat what I said many years ago. You have partners in us, the people of Palestine and the leadership of Palestine. So my friends, we Palestinians remain steadfast in our vision of peace and self-determination. <laughs> Two states on the 1967 borders, a state of Palestine 
with East Jerusalem as its capital. An open city for all the three Abrahamic faiths. And a just solution to the issue of refugees and the State of Israel. Yes, refugees do deserve an applaud. They have rights. They have rights. They have dreams. They are not a burden. They are an asset. They are a human being. They deserve your applause. Refugees deserve your applause. For years, they have been bedeviled. Palestinian refugees, including myself, have been a force of God everywhere they go. Look at them in the, in the Gulf states. Look at them wherever they go. They are an asset, and their rights can always be respected. But here, I would also say that that vision would have to include a state of Israel with final and secured internationally recognized borders and with neighborly relations with us and the region. My friends, we still firmly believe that this is the best way forward. Uh, and let me say this, the two-state solution was never a Palestinian demand. It was never about absolute justice. The two-state solution was a Palestinian concession, painful but essential for investing in the cause of peace. And investing in the cause of peace is not by words, but by deeds, and we have done our share. We have recognized, we have done our share, and we will continue doing our share. Peace is too precious, too noble, too long waited for. We have done our dues, and we will continue doing our dues. Number one, we have recognized the state of Israel on 78% of historic Palestine. That recognition came from the legitimate leadership of the Palestinian people, from Yasser Arafat and the PNC, voting in the most national democratic way for peace and for recognizing the state of Israel. And we take no shame in recognizing the two-state solution. We take no shame in recognizing our neighbors. We may take a bit of, this, a bit of shame on not achieving the end game. But investing in peace is something that we always and will always do. We signed the Oslo Accords in 1993 because we believe that we have to engage in a process that would see the end of Israel's occupation, that would see the establishment of a sovereign state of Palestine. And we did not wait for that to come. We engaged in building the state bottom up from the ground, building our institutions that the international community have said that already it's at the level of sovereign, independent, middle-income countries. We are so proud of our institutions, of our policemen, of our ability to provide for our people in the spheres of health, education, despite the most adverse circumstances. And we worked during these years with the Arab world to offer Israel the Arab Peace Initiative. 22 Arab countries, 22 Arab countries. And with them, the rest of the Islamic world, 57 countries, to offer Israel normalization as an outcome of peace. We worked with our brothers in the Arab world and sisters because we want to provide an incentive for peace. But we will not allow this to be a substitute for peace. Normalization is an outcome of peace, not a substitute for peace. And my friends, we have no time to mince our words. It has become bluntly clear 
that Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is only interested in a win-all, lose-all formula. And despite all this for all these years, we did not let go of our vision, of our commitment, of our investments for peace. Our response during all these difficult years was to face up the challenges by adopting non-violence, including popular, peaceful struggle on the ground and reverting to internationalism, internationalism, the international law, the international system, the United Nations. Since 1988, when that declaration in Algiers of declaring an independent state of Palestine, ipso facto recognizing the state of Israel. Since then, we have been unwavering, rock solid in our commitments. We did not change a bit. We do not allow difficult times to change our commitments, our vision, our sense of destination. No, we defend it, we solidify it, we protect it. Since then, our yeses have been absolutely known to the world, but this is an occasion in front of you, my friends, to reaffirm our yeses. The first yes, yes to a dignified and just peace. The second yes, yes to a two-state solution on the 1967 borders. Yes to internationalism and to international resolutions. Yes to nonviolence. Yes to nonviolence. We will not allow, we will not allow the curse of blood to stand between us. No matter what our political differences is, no matter how much the oppression is, no matter how many snipers there is around Gaza now, we shall believe in the power of the people, the masses, the power of the nonviolence. Number five. Yes, to a two democratic and egalitarian states. It is not just any two states we are after. These two sovereign states must give their citizens full equal rights. No other consideration. No other consideration but the rule of law. Not the creed, not the color, not the religion, not how tall or how short, not the language you speak or you, the God you pray for, but the fact that you are a citizen of that state. Yes to that. Yes to that. No to racism. No to discrimination. And finally, yes to a meaningful, genuine, credible peace process. But friends, hear me out here. And it is important that I say on behalf of the people and leadership of Palestine what I am about to say now. The leadership that has been struggling for over half a century, bringing their people and bringing the international community to the consensus that peace can never prevail without justice. We may have issues back home, my friends, and I take note of any voice here. We may have issues, but don't waste our time or lose sight of the fact that Palestinians can only themselves bring about the representation. Don't meddle and don't intervene.
And I'll go on on this because it's an important subject. Nothing we pride ourselves more in Palestine than our democratic process. It has been interrupted for 10 years, painfully so. It has interrupted because no one wants to convene elections without these elections being national. We will not convene elections without East Jerusalem. And we will not convene elections without Gaza. We will only convene elections when elections are national and we are working towards that to be national. Now, I want to say and ask, ask the people of Palestine, they will never, ever accept any leader or leadership if they are not elected. Even when they are elected, there are a lot of opposition. <laughs> so leave us alone. Our domestic situation is not easy. But I tell you, we cherish our ability to renew our democratic process. Now, about how much our yeses are unwavering, solid, like a rock, have always survived the test of time, moments of despair like this one. But so are our no's. So are our no's. So here is the first no. Here is the first no. No to redefining what the two-state solution means. No to that. No to that. Big, fat, no. No state minus. No state minus. No interim arrangements. We've done that. No lasting process. We've done that. We want lasting peace. No state with provisional borders. No state without East Jerusalem, its capital. And no state at the expense of two-thirds of the Palestinian people. No state without resolving the issue of refugees. And no state without Gaza and no state in Gaza. And let me say the last no in this area. No state, no state with one Israeli soldier on its soil. Not one. The second big no we have is no to the U.S. administration decision on Jerusalem. No to that. No to that. No. Big no. We rejected that announcement and decision then, and we reject it now, because that decision does not help the cause of peace because Jerusalem is the key to peace. And because Jerusalem is the very heart of what you and us believe in, the two-state solution. Without Jerusalem, there can never be a two-state solution. That decision was not only counterproductive to peace, but it did not do justice to the identity, to the history, to the reality of Jerusalem. Jerusalem for millennia has been inclusive, inclusive, open, tolerant, diverse. People of all faith, Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived together, coexisted. The keys of the church of the Holy Sepulchre is held for hundreds of years with a Muslim family. And Muslim families in the old days with candle, the Jewish candle, the Shabbat candle for their Jewish neighbors throughout the history of that city. 
But today is an anomaly. Jerusalem will always reject claims of exclusivity. No one can have exclusive claims of Jerusalem, and no one shall. We, we promise you, we vow in front of you, that once peace prevails, once the state of Palestine is established, once that state has East Jerusalem, its capital, that city will not only recognize the Jewish connection to Jerusalem, but we will celebrate the Jewish connection to Jerusalem. All these unilateral decisions by the Israeli Prime Minister and by the U.S. administration, but particularly by the administration, do not change the status of Jerusalem, I assure you, or the status of refugees after cutting aid to UNRWA, or change the status of the historic and legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. They don't. It doesn't. The only status that changed since the announcement in Jerusalem, the only status that changed is the status of the U.S. as a mediator. Since 1988, we kept our promises, our commitments, and our relentless investments and efforts to achieve the two-state solution. We stayed the course. We stayed on the negotiating table for 26 years nonstop. So those who say we walk away from negotiation, come on, grow up. We have been over negotiating, if you want the truth. And during these 26 years, my friends, America could not bring itself to the level of an honest, neutral mediator. But we kept on. We kept on. You know why we kept on for 26 years? Because the U.S., during all that time, did not change its promises, did not change its policy. It remained committed to the two-state solution on the 1967 borders. Unfortunately, no more. By the 6th of December 2017, the U.S. has reneged on its own promises, has reneged on its long-held U.S. policy, and has violated international law. But let us set the record clear here, very clear. There will be no deal there will be no deal, no agreement short of fulfilling the international resolutions that we have long accepted. There will be no deal that does not fulfill the very right, righteous, legitimate, historic rights of people in all divines. What happened was not taking Jerusalem off the table, my friends, but removing the table altogether. Removing the table altogether. Since the start of the peace process in 1991, we have never and will never negotiate the principles. Please hear me out here. Not once, from the Madrid to the Oslo to the roadmap, to name it, have ever we accepted to negotiate the principles. The principles would be listed on page one of all these agreements. We were there for 26 years to find ways with our Israeli neighbors and with the international community, led by the U.S., to implement these principles. No one, no one has the right to undo these principles. But, however, yet we will not succumb. We will not succumb to the current reality, and we will work with you and with the million of peace-loving people worldwide to protect our vision to maintain our commitments and to keep working towards a two-state solution. Our alternative to these unilateral acts is not unilateralism. Our alternative is multilateralism. Multilateralism. We are calling for the ending of the exclusion of the international community. Our president, Mahmoud Abbas, presented in the Security Council only in February the Palestinian peace 
plan, the PPP. I hope you all going to also revisit that plan. It's crucial. In that plan, he called for the convening of an international peace conference by mid of this year. That international conference by the international community should provide a way forward for the two-state solution, should provide a mechanism for implementing international resolutions. My friends, it is not only the absence of a state of Palestine that is keeping the grave injustices. It's not just the absence of the state that is keeping the injustices. But it is the presence of Israel's military occupation that sustains and deepens the morally, the morally corrupted system of hegemony, subjugation, and segregation. For those who believe in the two-state solution, the goal must be one, ending the military occupation. Ending the military occupation. Ending the military occupation. For peace can no longer, my friends, afford ambiguity. And there are few who are very ambiguous on purpose. For justice can no longer be left to spend doctors and self-centered politicians. And we have many of them these days. Peace is too noble too precious, long waited for, and the one thing that will make it nearer is the clarity of the undivided, undivided values and principles and the clarity of our joint purpose and action. What will produce peace, my friends, is us, all of us, standing united to rid the Israelis, the Palestinians, the region, and the rest of the world of the plague named military occupation. Our people, and I must go faster, I'm about to finish, but our people are being humiliated, incarcerated, terrorized, and killed every day. We cannot afford processing the peace process another hundred years as Maybe the Israeli current government wants to. We want it now. It's urgent, very urgent. And we see that it's not all about the despair surround all of us, but it's also about the hope. And I'll give you a few examples of the hope that fills our hearts. The first is that we also see the responsibility to as many Israelis that they see their children and grandchildren and they think of their future. We see, we see that despite the uncertainty and the vicious attacks by the anti-peace camp, we still have the hope because of our people, the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people in Bodrus, in Bil'in, in Na'lin, in Nabi Saleh, in Kufur Qaddum, in Jerusalem in July, in Gaza the last two weeks, adopting mass nonviolent means, coming up with creative ways we see that power coming out when people are using prayer mattresses to declare their rights and to defend their rights, as happened in Jerusalem. We take absolute note, and we are heartwarming of Palestinians. Palestinians. And by the way, unfortunately, accidents, road accidents happen regularly in the West Bank. And it, it, it does warm our hearts when Palestinian ordinary citizens rush to save the lives of Israelis who are involved in these traffic accidents. Because in the end, it's our humanity that comes first before anything else. <laughs> hope, hope is the young American Jews, like the brave souls in If Not Now. <laughs> if Not Now. <laughs> hope is the Israeli human rights group Beit Salem. <laughs> Hope is the Israeli peace activists that immediately went to Gaza last week, locked the Israeli soldiers face to face to hold them accountable for their lethal actions and targeted killing of Palestinian civilians. That is hope for us. Hope is 
Tamar Zandberg. Is she here? Tamar Zambring. <laughs> Calling on her government to investigate fully what happened in Gaza. Hope is Rabbi Eric Asherman. who stood up to settler extremists, beating him before continuing their job of beating the Palestinian farmers. Hope is the many, many Israeli activists who stand shoulder to shoulder with us as we struggle to end the occupation. It warms my heart to know we have allies like you and like them back there. Allies with such courage and conviction to stand up for what is right. You are not dreamers, but realists. You are not dreamers, but realists. You understand too well that the best future is a future that shines just as bright for Palestinians as it does for Israelis. That's what I see in this room, the hope for all sides to live together. We also take hope from American leaders, principled leaders, representatives. And I'm humbled that the man who will take this stage be after me is Senator Bernie Sanders. We noted his courageous, brave defense, not of Palestinians, but of the American values he represents. We noted his defense, Sanders, uh, Senator Sanders, of the rights of people in Gaza and all over to protect the right for peaceful protest. It is their right to protest peacefully. And we take hope from the many, many, many American youth all over, all over, who are doing one thing. They are no longer considering the American values to be undivided. The values of freedom, of justice, of liberty, of potential and prosperity. We see them everywhere. They are growing. The public opinions are showing that the American public, particularly youth, give us hope and certainty. I'd like to end here by saying this. You in this room give us and give the cause of peace real, real hope. The hope that keeps us going despite all the above. That hope will get us through these difficult times, we promise you and towards a better future. Remember, my friends, the road is long and tiring. It is. It is us, however, that are winning. It is us that are winning because we are on the right side of history. We stay strong together and uphold our shared values for equality, human rights, and justice across all divides. Do not let the current circumstances discourage you. You know better than anybody else that the best antidote to discouragement is action. Through action, we create the future that we want, my friends. And I believe that we are much nearer to the future we want than those who are pulling us away from the future we want. We are striving for a just peace, and our striving for just peace starts with ending occupation. Together, my friends, let's keep the march. Thank you very much.